Welcome everyone. This is Cindy McDonald and I am so pleased to welcome you to this month's interview. This is part of a series of interviews that we're doing this year for Guided Path and our theme for this year is paths to education. What kind of paths do our students take to education and there is no one right path or wrong path. It all has to do with what our students' needs are. And I'm very pleased to have with us today a very special guest, Joyce Finding Morgan. She is an author. She has been an educator and a counselor and an advisor for many years. And I'll let her share a little bit more about her background. But welcome, Joyce. We're glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Cindy. I'm glad to be here. And just so some of you know a little bit about me, my name is Cindy McDonald. I am also a counselor. I've been working with students for over 25 years. I've worked with the AVID program for the last 14 and have found great satisfaction in working with students and counselors and administrators and helping students to find their path to education. And so it's been my pleasure to speak with and talk with Joyce to talk with you today about our topic and that's the undeclared major. So many people, especially um, parents these days are looking at the return on their investment and so they often talk to us as counselors and say well they've got to know what their majors are as they go to school. Does selecting the right college for a student require them to have a specific major in mind? No, not always. In fact, in the United States, rather rarely. Um, when a, an application asks for a major, what would you like to major in? Often there's a drop down list. And one of the majors on that drop down list is undecided. And I understand that that's the most popular one. The program that we offer so often in the United States, in colleges and universities, is called liberal arts and sciences. Whether or not the actual college within a university is called that. And the idea is that a student will explore a curriculum to see what the options are, what the possibilities are before deciding where to concentrate. And in the meantime, acquiring an education that trains them broadly. I was interested because last week I visited Abu Dhabi and the campus of NYU there and was guided by a student from India and a student um, from Canada both of whom were looking at American colleges so that they could explore options at the university level before settling into a specialty, which would be unlike what they would do at home. I do understand that sometimes there are situations in which a student must declare a major um, in, in the application process. And in those circumstances, it's well to ask the university should have a response. Um, in some universities, there's no problem at all. If you go on to the website of, say, Syracuse University, which has a number of colleges, they suggest that you explore broadly, that you not decide too quickly. Right down the road, it's in the same state and not that far away as Cornell. If you are accepted into the College of Engineering and decide you'd really rather poetry, you must withdraw and apply again. That's unusual, mostly in the United States. You have those two years to explore and then decide your major focus. That's why it's called major. It's not the only focus, but the major focus. That's very interesting. We deal with this in California quite a bit because one of the schools that's very popular for many students, both in state and out of state, is the California Polytechnique. Um, or Cal Poly as we like to call it, you have to declare a major there. And so what happens is, is sometimes students use that as part of the gaming 
uh, you know, a gaming strategy. Well, I'll go into an unpopular major and get into it under that major, and then I'll switch over. And now the university has made it so that, just like as you described with Cornell, it's very difficult once you get into that particular college, agriculture or you know some other area you're not going to switch over into business or engineering and so it adds to a different kind of culture in terms of what majors to select and how to approach that so how does being undecided affect a student's path to higher education you shared the example of the student at the Adobe, NYU Adobe campus, and how, how have you seen that, especially with students you've worked with and as an author of this book, um, Admission Matters, how does that affect a student's path to education? Well, if we are still talking about a student who is not really funneled into that decision at the outset, at the application point, in some kind of irreversible way, and I understand where the politics are coming from, because if it is being gamed and has been gamed, that's really an, an untenable position for them, and they have to do something. Um, I don't think that is common everywhere, but right. if that becomes a growing situation, yeah, more and more colleges will have to do that. Um, um, and, and, and to be upfront about it. So, to just leave it there for a minute, a student in that situation needs to research what their options would be if they apply under one major and decide to change. Is there a way to do that? Is that impossible? The, the college, the university will tell them right up front. But other than that, when I work with students, I ask them what they're good at, what they really enjoy, what lifts their spirit and what they've looked around and say, oh, I wish I could learn how to do X. Well, that's another option. Um, I've been fascinated, actually, and I will be using this more and more, with um, an article that Nicholas Lemon, the author of uh, The Big Test, published in Chronicle of Higher Education a year ago in January. And at that time, he, he pondered, and you know, he'd been the dean of, the, of Columbia School of Journalism. So as an administrator, he thought of, you know, what are the essentials of an education? What, what do we really want to, to teach students? Um, and here's what he said, and, and this is what I'm using, actually. What an education, a, what he says, would produce a version of what it means to be a college graduate regardless of one's major because we do know this is me not not Nick Lemon we do know that the jobs that are apt to be around for our students 20 years from now haven't been dreamt up yet mm -hmm. so how do you prepare for that right, right. but there, there are things you need to know to to be an educated person and so he said he would prefer to create a canon of methods rather than a canon of specific knowledge or one of great books, skill sets, if you will. And um, a quick list of the possibilities. One, there are eight of them. A rigorous interpretation of meaning taught mainly through close reading of texts. We can all kind of imagine which departments these would fall in. Second, numeracy including basic statistical literacy. Third, pattern and context recognition. Fourth, developing and stating an argument in spoken and written form. Fifth, visual and spatial grammar and logic. Six, understanding how information is produced, how to locate it, and how much faith to put in it. Seven, an empathetic understanding of other people and other cultures. And eighth, learning to explore rigorously the relationship between cause and effect and to, do, to draw plausible inferences. And he emphasizes that he doesn't see this within existing courses. He would design courses to teach exactly those things 
but I think if a student were to sit down and say, this is the range of things I should have some acquaintance with, some of them I hope to get really good at. Now we're beginning to move toward what might be a major, but not to exclude the rest and not to, if you'll excuse the expression, blow off the gen ed requirements. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there for. That kind of, of breadth of skill set. And so to parents, I say, if, if we really want to prepare our students for the work they'll be doing in a couple of decades, then they need a broad education. So I want to go back to a couple of things that you said, and um, this list of these eight skills and this article by Nicholas Lemon, I want to let people know, um, we'll post this as part of our recording of this webin uh, webinar or the interview, so you'll be able to look at it and see this list that Joyce just shared with you, because I think it's very pertinent, and it actually goes back to the theme that we had in our first interview, which was with Maria Furtado from the Colleges That Change Lives, and that was her point as well, is the value of a liberal arts education connects to the value of you don't have to know exactly what you want to major in, and that you can get value out of a college education going in as an undeclared student because you're looking for these skills and these um, critical thinking that, because you don't know, there are jobs that haven't even been invented yet. Who knew you would have a job of uh, managing social media? You know, that wasn't invented even hardly 10 years ago. So, you know, who knows what the future is going to be and um, what kind of opportunities. And there'll be many jobs that, that are fading away that may be very popular right now. So focusing on those much harder um, critical thinking skills is definitely something that we can look at. The other thing that you mentioned, and this is what I see as a counselor over the last few years, is, you know, coming from high school, Students have such a prescribed curriculum. They have to take all this math, all this history, all these different things, and they really don't have room left in their schedules or opportunities to find out what would political science class be or an astronomy class. They don't have an opportunity to explore. So there are things they've never experienced. How, is it, how are they going to be able to, at 17 or 18, choose a major when they haven't explored the the opportunities or the breadth of different topics or majors to study out there. And you had mentioned using those first two years to explore that. And don't you see that as part of the value of a general education requirement as well? Absolutely. Not only the general education or core, but they're going to be among other students who have other skills, other interests, who get excited about things they never heard about before. Mm -hmm. from places they've never heard of before. Um, <coughs> excuse me. There are a range of extracurricular opportunities that can also feed into this. Mm -hmm. Or can scratch the itch of a student who says, you know, I love to play the piano or the trombone. Um, I don't want to major in music. But who can continue that part of themselves with people who maybe are majoring in music. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more even than just the courses at the university. And that brings up a whole other point too. And this is one of the things that reasons in Guided Path in our online college planning tool, we have a very extensive search. And it's not just about what the major is or what sports it's looking at the whole fit and the whole experience because you know just as you pointed out students learn as much or sometimes even more in the other experiences and you know what they're volunteering or the social experience you know going to the having lunch at the dining hall and um you know they just the, the, the their educational experience is so much more than just the class they're sitting in. So how can we as counselors help students and help guide our undecided students or 
And the second part to that question is how do we build those communications that that's okay with parents? Um, because that's often the conversation that we have. It's more with the parents than with the students. So what are your thoughts on that? One is I collect stories. One of my stories, for example, for parents who are determined that their child must major in biochemistry because they're going to become a surgeon, and et cetera, was um, meeting, meeting Dr. Koop, who was the Surgeon General and newly appointed then to head up uh, Dartmouth Medical School. And he, he was very upset that medicine had become so laboratory oriented that people had forgotten that it was human beings they were dealing with. And he reorganized the pro program so that his medical students were required to take courses in things like poetry. He wanted them to, to rediscover that human element, um, to go beyond the laboratory and the, the science courses and, you know, the clinicals, and to see people as people. Um, and so at, at this meeting, there was a, a colleague, young colleague who was an intern, um, who had been a philosophy major, and she spoke to him about how her path might proceed because she was feeling called to medicine. And he said, apply to Dartmouth. And she did. He was delighted to have her. Um, he, she was, I think, one of his, his first philosophy majors to become a doctor. Um, but so there, there are shifts like this. I think it's fun to look at a database, and I don't know if you can publish this as well, but I know that you've seen it, and maybe many others have who are, are listening to our conversation, that was produced by John uh, Birkenstadt oh. from, yeah, from DePaul University in, in Chicago. And he, he is NACAC's data guru. And it's, it's fun to explore. Um, you, look, you can look at a major and see what people in this rather large grouping have done subsequently from that major. The missing piece is, no, you don't go from being a major in Russian literature to being a neurosurgeon. There are a few steps in between, like medical school, but, so, and that isn't in there. But in fact, an undergraduate can major in many things and go in many directions. And let me see what he says. I have it written down because I thought it was... I put this together to help show how almost any major can cause you to end up almost anywhere. And I think that's one, one tool that I will try to use with parents as well. Mm -hmm. Granted, the number of English majors who go into dentistry are few, but they exist. And that's really reassuring. Absolutely. I think, and we'll, I'll pull that and um, post that as well so that um, we have John Beckenstadt's um, link to what, what happens if I major in what, you know, acts. And I think that's very telling. It also shows where our educational system is in the United States right now is a lot of times when I talk to students and parents, it's about, well, what's your terminal degree? You know, are you doing a certificate? Are you going to just do a two-year program? Which is perfectly fine. And there's great vocational programs, you know, at the community college or, you know, two-year level. Um, those are fantastic. Um, are you doing the four-year? So, yes, you want to major in psychology. Psychology is the most popular major on campuses right now. But frankly, there's not a lot you can do with a BS in psychology. You should know that you're going to plan and go on. But then from there, you can go do anything. And people are very surprised to learn that you can be a physician or an attorney or any of these other professions um, with, you know, a financial analyst um, without having a degree in that as an undergraduate. And it's getting the foundation and exploring the options. Um, you know, the statistics show that even if students pick a major, you know, what, 60%, 70% of them are going to change their major once they get to college anyway. When so, I was teaching at the University of New Hampshire, I taught, one of the courses I taught was Introduction to Nonfiction Writing. And it was required of a number of, of, of majors, including all the engineering students. 
um, which amused me, didn't amuse them. But at any rate, um, every week the, the course was taught both in, in hour or hour and a half sessions and weekly meetings. And every week, at least three or four students would have a brand new major. Mm -hmm. the next week another three or four would have a brand new major and then toward the end of sophomore year they'd be agonizing over which of these tempting majors they would actually select and of course we do have double majors we have majors and minors i even knew one student who did a triple major mm -hmm. but um it's the fact that they are attracted to so much actually speaks well of their education and they will choose something and become more expert in that area, but it may not be where they end up. Right. You know, it, again, it, it could be the comparative literature major who goes on to be a dentist. Mm -hmm. Well, and what do you see the role of um, assessments in this? I know in my work as a counselor, I often give students a personality assessment so that they can see, well, what other people doing who have similar personalities as you? So at least it gives them an idea, and they're not just picking a major based on this is what I know or what I've seen on TV or what my parents want me to do um, and you know seeing where their personalities fit and sometimes I find the reason they want to they're drawn to all these things and they can't decide is because they are well-rounded and their right brain is developed just as much as their left brain and they are conflicted because they have all these different areas that they're um, you know that are pulling and so that's college can build that opportunity for them to expand or develop one side of that brain versus the other um, well they, but there's more I think that is also a useful tool I mean I guess one of the things I say and I say it early on is research 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 mm -hmm. find out everything you can um, but life is full and rich and changes and so i would imagine that the 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 child who has a balanced right and left brain and is tempted in, in several directions is going to find ways to use that not necessarily in where they're employed mm -hmm. but possibly in raising a child who is like that or being part of a community endeavor that does this right so all of this is is possible and i think encouraging students first of all encouraging students to relax mm -hmm. to explore mm -hmm. yes they will choose um and then to realize the fullness that their life can be yeah yeah, and you know, you talk about stories, and I'm remembering back on one of my students, and I often, we often see this, especially with um, students who have artistic type of inclinations, and you know, this one young man uh, from um, an Asian background, and of course, his, you know, very strong. Um, focus on education from his family and he was supposed to go into accounting or into you know engineering and I looked at his profile I was like well art is something that's an integral part of you and if you don't even if you do this as part of your leisure you know in the community you can't neglect this or you will have a hole in your life and I think it comes down and what I explain to my students it's the difference between having a job and having a career and a career is something that you love. You get up every morning and say, I get to do this. That sometimes takes the research, it takes the exploring, um, you know, and it takes that those different things to, to find what is that going to be. And sometimes they don't know. We don't all know what we're going to do in the end. Um, and it takes an opportunity. That's where internships and things like that are so valuable because then you can take what you're learning and apply it in the real world and see how it's going to affect you. So There are colleges that encourage internships as early as freshman year for exactly that reason for two mm -hmm. reasons one for the student who knows exactly what they want to do right test it make sure that you're right here before you commit four years to this and the student who has no idea but well that might be interesting and 
either it is or it isn't, but they've explored it, they've done it, they're out there. And watching adults who are doing this and <laughs> doing it at a more advanced level. So that's an, another aspect of research. And frankly, it doesn't have to wait to college. Right. So right. the earlier they can shadow, um, talk with professionals, and ideally affect some kind of internship relationship in a field that might be interesting. And, and for the artist, I had at one point a pair of Korean brothers and they had decided that really what was needed was more helpful things for people as old as their grandparents. Eventually, one went into design because this was the artist and the other went into engineering. They combined forces, and you can hear how it went back and forth, and they would have an idea, and the one would sort of design it, and the other would start to work out how it might be made, and then they would test it, and then the design would get better because the grandparents maybe said, well, 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 you're, well, you're, and then the artist would kick it. But there there are, is a way for almost every inclination to work productively and happily is, is my conviction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it starts with who are you? What do you love? What are you good at? What do you want to be good at? And what is the path then forward? Um, is it simply a bachelor's degree? Is that enough? And then you get to practice it? Or do you need more? Think now. When I started out, I certainly had no idea that I was going to proceed beyond the bachelor's degree um, and did. So mm -hmm. they don't always know the answer to that question. That's true. That's, That's true. Very That's true. Very true. One of the things, one of the my things, stories my that, stories I, have that is, I have is from one of my students that I worked with, and I'm suddenly getting a big echo. I'm not sure why. Um, okay, there's love of technology here, but, you know, looking and learning, and I think that's another thing that goes back to is helping students to learn more about themselves, and I had this young lady come in, and she was bound to determine she was going to do accounting, so I did this assessment with her personality assessment, it's based on the Holland model, and, and, you know, that's why we have different assessments included in Guided Path to give students and parents an opportunity to do that, and so she was doing accounting, but her assessment came out with more of the, the social side and the artistic side, so I thought, well, have you ever thought about communications? She's like, nope, I'm going to do accounting. Well, I knew that wasn't going to last, just looking at her needs and strengths and all, I knew accounting was not going to be her forte. So she spent one semester in um, at the college. She happened to go to the University of the Pacific, which has an outstanding communications program, and she switched over to communications. She ended up doing two internships, one for ESPN and another one for the largest BR firm in the nation. When she graduated with her communications degree, she ended up having offers from both companies. She worked, ended up working with a PR firm in New York, ended up being the editor for several fashion magazines, and now comes back as a guest lecturer for um, UOP. And, you know, as an example of somebody who's able to achieve at that high level, she started out as an accountant major, but was able to go way farther and achieve much more in an area that was much more suited to who she was. And, um, you know, so I think that's your idea of having stories for families has a lot. And that's one of the things we can do as, as counselors is to be able to share. It's not, you don't have to have a major in order to go to college. And it's not, doesn't spell that you're going to be unsuccessful or spend more time in college either because many colleges are built to give you that time to reflect. Well, part of, it, part of the research, too, that a student should do, especially, I think all students have to do this, so whether they know exactly what they want to do, I always don't trust that. Um, they're only 17 or have no clue just where they might declare a major is to learn about the advising systems and how that is delivered at every college that they explore. Um, there's a great variety. 
talk to students that are already there about advising, if at all possible, but learn how they will be supported as they settle into the next four years of their education. There, and I think that's great advice, and, and, and that is the kind of research that students should be conducting and the questions should be asking, especially as they go visit or look at colleges or contact them. So I'm looking at the time, Joyce. It's amazing how fast time goes by. I want you to tell a little bit about your book and, um, you know, that it's coming out. I understand. I can hardly wait. The new edition's coming out. So tell us a little bit more about Admission Matters, what's changed, and when can people start ordering that? And we're going to put that on our website and our links, oh, lovely, too. Thank you. Um, it's, coming, it's coming out in it's all its glory on May 1st, but it can be pre-ordered now at Amazon.com and Target.com. Um, we have a website that supports it because as we know things are constantly changing slightly although this year and the reason for the book really was this year there was so much change in so many areas of the college admission process um that the the book wouldn't be useful if we didn't thoroughly update it but we've expanded a number of areas we've expanded uh the description of the kinds of college and universities We've expanded to the concept of fit and how you can explore that more fully and successfully. Um, we've done more with, um, let me see, we have a, a section in edition three on how colleges make their decision and it's focused on a highly selective private university. Now we've added to that how it is done at a highly selective and large public university, which I think is helpful. Of course, the, all the information on testing is updated. We've done also a comparison of SAT and ACT and how one might um, choose one rather than the other. Uh, we've also done much more with early decision and what the benefits and drawbacks are for students of, um, of early decision. Uh, there's more on international education and for international students, more on financial aid than we had before. Because given the opportunity, there is more information that we could share. And so it's in the book as much as we could put it there. And then after the book is in hard copy, it's a little hard to change then, but that's why the website. And so that's admissionmatters.com, and we update that and we will tie it into the pages of the fourth edition so that it will feed right into what's already in the book. Oh, that sounds fabulous. And so admissionmatters.com, and Admission Matters is the book. Um, Joyce Binding Morgan, Sally Springer, and John Ryder um, are the, all the authors, um, and it's, just, it's a great resource. If you don't have it in your um, arsenal of resources, it's definitely one you should add. I know we use it in our UCLA classes. It's one of the required texts for one of the classes. It's one of the things we feel really honored by, actually. Mm -hmm. We, we are pleased that people feel that as parents or as students, as counselors, that it's helpful, but that you actually use it to help people who are seeking to become counselors is wonderful. Yep, we, we do. We, and they are very, um, my students are just ravenous. They love reading it and asking questions and, and having the updated version will be very beneficial because things have, as you said, they've changed so dramatically and, and it raises so many questions. So we have some questions. We have a little bit of time. I'm going to take, I, I, we won't be able to reach all the questions. We've got quite a few that are very um, insightful and, and thoughtful, um, but I want to just a, a address a couple and then we'll see I'll send you other ones too okay so an, an anonymous viewer says unfortunately college isn't a time to go find yourself anymore because of the cost and that's a very good point it's very expensive to go to college um, you know what do you do in that kind of environment you know how do you make sure a students only going to spend four years even if they're trying to find themselves or going in declared Well, 
declaring a major and finding yourself are two different things. Um, if someone is really, really at, at that point of finding themselves and feeling insecure, they may not be ready to go right off to college. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I suggest a, a gap year. Mm -hmm. In fact, Harvard suggests a gap year. So I'm in good company there. Um, and not rushing off to college, perhaps. Settling in, I find most students who have done a gap year, a pl well-planned gap year, are eager for college. They have found themselves. I, there's a level to it which we're all still finding ourselves. So, I, very true. That's that's, and I think that's a good option. And we, and we are actually going to be. Um, the next month in March, we're going to be interviewing Marie Schwartz from Teen Life, and that's exactly what she's going to talk about, is gap year. So make sure, um, for those of you, mark on your calendar. You can go to the guidedpath.net website, and you'll see the March interview. Um, actually, I think March is with Christina Dooley, and she's going to talk about international. But in April, we're going to be interviewing with Maria Schwartz and talking about mm -hmm. gap year. So there's a question here about it, uh, selective admissions and you know do uh, selective admissions colleges or committees you know do they look more favorably on students who have a declared interest say in foreign languages or some area like that she says. Um, you know, even at a liberal arts college, would they look more favorably on applicants who appear very focused in a particular area? You know, what are your thoughts on that versus someone who has no clear focus at all? I think if the student is eager to learn, mm -hmm. is adventurous about learning, that that's actually a positive. Um, I think that can be read either way. Someone who perhaps is, is too focused might not be as interesting to teach as someone who really explores many areas, can bring them together, and is excited about learning, just hasn't decided on the one major focus. Or maybe has decided on 15 of them, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had students rather like that. So do you have any, you've mentioned some different schools, do you have any um, experience or data that supports that a student's not put at a disadvantage if they have an undeclared major in no. an admissions process? No, I, I wouldn't say that's not something that I would have. This is purely okay. experiential. Okay, yeah. And I, I think it would be pretty hard to have some, because um, so often they're looking at, so many factors and the declaration of a major and what I tell students it all has to be consistent you know their application has to tell their story but it has to be a congruent story so if they are seeing some of this um, throughout some of the other things and stories that they're telling I think it will be important but there are also schools that do as we've already indicated have you know basically a requirement so Christy asked um, you know how do you approach for a student who's undecided but is interested in a school which is looking that for students come major ready and she uses UT as an example and my example would be Cal Poly so so what do you do for a student in that situation well the first the first thing is to question the fit mm -hmm. um, if if but they're really not decided and the school insists on this or values it very highly is this really a good match for them do they need that time to ex to to take courses to explore the curriculum so that they know when they decide on a major what it is they're deciding on as you said there are so many areas that are not available to them in high school that the possibilities in college um, are not always clear to them. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's where, you know, 
working with students, doing the research, doing the internships, there's so much that we can do at the high school level and even down to the middle school level to help and support. You know, I know in my work with AVID, we started in fifth and sixth grade. I mean, they have career projects and things in elementary school. So, um, you know, it's not a one done, one done and done, uh, once done type of situation. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Joyce. This has been such a pleasure. Uh, we, will, we have recorded this, so this will be available. And if you have further questions, feel free to send them to to us. You can send them to support at guidedpath.net and we'll be able to um, you know, take up any other subsequent questions. And join us again for next month's interview. We're going to be interviewing Christina Dooley and we're going to talk about international students coming to the U.S. and what that's looking like. And especially now, I think things are changing dramatically almost week by week with our whole political climate here in the United States. I mean, we just had a huge announcement yesterday. I know this is just a very volatile subject, so it should prove to be a very good, lively discussion um, interview with Christina. Joyce, again, thank you very much and I hope you en enjoy the rest of your evening. I know you're in Qatar and <laughs> it's nighttime for you. It's um, daytime here in, in California, but um, thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to speaking with you again soon. My great pleasure. Thank you, Cindy. All right, you take care. Everyone, this does conclude our interview for Guided Path today. Look for your uh, link in your email box, and those of you who aren't able to attend, we'll be sending those to you as well. So everybody have a great day.